You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Potentially any case is a good candidate for ADR. Uh, it really, it depends less on the nature of the case than it does on the interest of the parties. For me, it's a, it's a sliding scale of time and the resources in dispute. The ADR skill set of mediation and problem solving and issue identification is something we use in discovery matters and in um, summary judgment. Our philosophy is that the best way to get a case settled is to get the parties talking about settlement before their, part, their positions have hardened and before they've expended all of the discretionary dollars on preparing for the trial and discovery. Live from the Federal Judicial Center studios in Washington, D.C., here's your host, Bob Fagan. We're delighted you've joined us for this program. We're going to be talking about case management and mediation, a subject that wouldn't have gotten much attention only a few years ago, but for a number of reasons, statutory requirements, for example, and the rapid development of ADR in private legal practices, most federal district courts and many bankruptcy courts have adopted local rules authorizing the use of ADR in civil cases. So today, more judges are asking questions about how they can effectively incorporate mediation into their management of civil cases. Both judges and attorneys, in fact mediators too, know the frustration of hearing that mediation was not effective in a case because the case wasn't right for mediation. Could the judge or parties have seen this coming? How does a judge select appropriate cases? When is a case ripe for mediation? We're going to talk with judges, attorneys, and mediators about these matters. Our first three guests are federal judges. A bit later in the program, we'll talk with two attorneys, mediator, and a magistrate judge mediator. Let me now turn to my colleague, Donna Steenstra, senior researcher at the Federal Judicial Center, who will introduce the members of the panels and moderate the program. Thanks, Bob. It's great to have you with us for this discussion of case management and mediation. We have a wonderful group of judges, attorneys, and mediators here in our studio to share their experiences and views with you. We'll begin by talking with three judges, and I'd like to introduce them to you now. To my right is Judge Vanessa Gilmore from the Southern District of Texas, sitting in Houston. Judge Gilmore has been on that bench for nine years and has been an active user of the court's mediation program. To my left is Judge Robert Levy. Judge Levy is a magistrate judge in the Eastern District of New York and has been on that bench for eight years, sitting in New York City. For the past three years, Judge Levy has overseen his court's arbitration and mediation programs. Because of the heavy caseload in his district, it's not unusual for Judge Levy to conduct as many as 50 to 60 case management conferences in a given week, and he frequently refers cases to mediation. Our third guest is Judge Cecilia Morris, bankruptcy judge from the Southern District of New York, who was appointed in 2000 and sits in Poughkeepsie. Judge Morris has had a long interest in mediation, serving as a mediator for the Southern District of New York and for the NASDA, then creating the mediation program for the Southern District's bankruptcy court after she joined that court. I'd like to welcome all of you to the program. It's really great to have you here today. Um, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the way you use mediation in your judicial case management. I have heard it said, I'm sure we've all heard it said, that mediation is just another case management tool. Do you agree with that, Judge Gilmore? And if so, how do you use that tool? It is a good case management tool. It gives you another reason and opportunity to continue to talk to the lawyers uh, about a uh, a, an efficient and cost-effective method of resolving the disputes between the parties. Judge Morris, do you agree with that statement? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think every judicial offer, officer has a goal in mind of helping the parties to resolve their dispute. And mediation means helping the parties together to resolve, to come to the best resolution of their dispute. So it is a wonderful tool that can be used in any time and practically any case. Mm -hmm. Judge Levy. 
In preparing for this presentation, I spoke to some of my colleagues <coughs> who were questioning what's the difference between a settlement conference and a mediation, especially one who said he never refers cases to mediation. I thought about that. I think it is an ill-defined boundary, but I think one of the differences is that a mediation is typically before someone who will not be the trial judge. It also takes a longer time when a mediator should be prepared to have two or three days of mediation if necessary, mm -hmm. uh, and the parties are always present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have reviewed many of the court's local rules, and I have noticed that most of the courts leave the discretion about how to use mediation to the judge. There are, in fact, a few courts that mandatorily refer certain types of cases to mediation or to arbitration, but most leave the discretion uh, how to use and whether to use mediation to the judge. Um, that leaves the selection of cases to the judge. Um, would you describe, Judge Levy, what process you use for identifying cases? What, what information do you have in front of you, and, and how do you use it? Well, I, I use the, the initial case management conference, the Rule 16 conference. Mm -hmm. I have the complaint. I ask the parties to explain the uh, claims and defenses. And then I try to ascertain what obstacles there are to settlement and get the parties thinking about that. So what uh, I do is try to see if this case is, has the right chemistry for mediation and uh, if it's the right time. Mm -hmm. So you're making an assessment pretty early in the case then? Immediately. Immediately. Judge Morris, is that your practice as well? I think it's, I think you make an assessment immediately, but more than likely it's not until later in the case that I might uh, send it to mediation. And by that I'm getting the flavor of the case. I'm trying to find out, and, and, and same thing, I have case conferences. Find out in the case conference what is the flavor of this case. Uh, are the attorneys getting along? Are they, um, is discovery going smoothly? Uh, I don't add the layer of mediation because it adds a layer of cost. And by cost, I don't just mean dollar cost of a mediator, mm -hmm. but the cost to the parties of having to meet uh, until I see such time as it might make a resolution or that they, things aren't moving, discovery isn't moving forward, or they're not discussing what the real issues in the case are. And I get that through the flavor of um, these case conferences. So you're doing it a bit later in the case? A bit later in the case, but I think the assessment begins at the very beginning, just as Judge Levy said. Mm -hmm. uh, um, early on in the court's use of mediation, there was an, and I should say actually in the private practice use of mediation, there was an effort to identify categories of cases. If we could just come up with sort of a rule of thumb to identify those cases that are appropriate, it would make that referral process simpler. Um, Judge Gilmore, I want to ask you what you consider a good case and whether you think of the identification of cases that way. Are there types, are there case types, are there categories, or how do you make the identification? I think that almost any type of case could be appropriate for mediation. I've had particular success with mediating, uh, for instance, complex securities litigation cases, uh, some personal injury cases after sufficient discovery has been done, uh, school ADEA cases, uh, and uh, s not too often employment litigation, but occasionally some types of employment uh, litigation as well. I think that uh, once you make a determination, an initial determination, uh, that the case might be appropriate for mediation, uh, which I also do at the Rule 16 Scheduling Conference, you have to make an assessment of not just the factual and legal issues, but also the emotional issues that are involved with respect to the particular litigants to help you in making an assessment about whether or not the case mm -hmm. could be appropriate for mediation. Mm -hmm. I think you have to take all three of those things into consideration mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, making that final decision. Does that sound familiar to you, Judge Lee? Very familiar. Okay. Sometimes lawyers tell me I'd like to go to mediation. Other times there's an ongoing relationship that makes mediation especially appropriate. Sometimes there are creative solutions that are needed in a particular case, or most often uh, just a breakdown in communications that mediation could help mend. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you both saying is that you don't think about it in terms of the nature of suit necessarily, but you think about it in, in terms of some other kinds of characteristics of the case. I think that would be a fair assessment. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. How do you weigh the party resources in to this decision? If you have parties, for example, who don't have a great deal of resources, uh, and you're thinking of referring them to this additional process. Uh, how do you take that into consideration in making the referral? That can be a difficult issue. It's particularly a difficult issue when you have a pro se. Mm -hmm. 
and sometimes, well, our court has a, an experimental program now involving um, mediation for pro se's where we appoint advocates to help the pro se with the mediation. But typically, I try to, I ask the parties, what, what will the impact of mediation be? Mm -hmm. I actually did want to ask about two particular types of cases when making that decision about whether to refer a case. And one is the pro se cases. These are a particular challenge, I think, to court ADR programs. They seem in some ways the appropriate case because the parties need some additional help. But on the other hand, they can put a considerable burden on the mediator in the court to refer pro se cases. Judge Morris, I know you actually you've mediated pro se I cases. I have mediated pro se cases, and it puts the mediator in, in a very difficult position because sometimes even in asking the questions, you're helping them litigate their case. Mm -hmm. And that's a mediator is not there to help with the litigation mm -hmm. tactics. It's there to help resolve and help the uh, parties mm -hmm. come to the best resolution of their uh, mm -hmm. problems and their difficulties. I think um, the Eastern District's exper experimental program is excellent. The idea of having a pro bono attorney with the media, with the pro se litigant mm -hmm. is exciting. Right. Um, to just send one in, though, without it is very difficult. And as, as you said, I have I have mediated them, mm -hmm. and they are difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you refer them now? No, as a, as not a to pro se. No. No. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more, Judge Levy, about this, this program you've adopted in the Eastern District. I think it's something that many courts might be interested in because I've heard a lot of questions from the courts about do you have any advice about referring pro se's to mediation? Well, we have a magistrate judge who uh, is focused entirely on pro se cases. She sees all the pro se cases. She assesses the case for mediation. And then we have a list of attorneys who are willing to act as advocates for mediation. They're there only for the mediation, but they're also there to, to represent and give comfort to the pro se, help that person uh, formulate the issues in the case and understand how to work the process. So the pro se doesn't put undue pressure on the mediator for that kind of assistance and therefore risking the neutrality of That's the right. mediator. Right. The other type of case I'd like to ask about is complex litigation. I know, Judge Morris, you have a lot of big, complex bankruptcy cases. Are these suitable for mediation? Oh, I think they're absolutely ripe for mediation. Uh, one thing in the big, complex cases, and particularly one area, it's across border insolvencies, mm -hmm. and where you have other courts and other uh, venues where other actions are going on and to get a mediator that can bring that all together so everybody is on the same page and simply talking. Um, it may not totally resolve an issue, but it could certainly narrow the issues down to where um, some resolution could be made. Uh, though That's one prime example. Um, the other prime example is even when it's not a cross-border, when there are other courts involved and these big cases have state courts involved, they have other federal courts involved, they, it, it's just many complicated issues and getting this under one umbrella where people are all sitting and talking and discussing and moving toward a resolution. Mm -hmm. You have more than enough complex cases in the Southern District of Texas as well, Judge Gilmer. Yes, but, and mediation and is very is a very good tool to use in, in uh, complex litigation and, and as Judge Morris was saying, sometimes you send them to mediation in very complex cases not for the purpose of trying to seek a full resolution of the case but simply trying to narrow the issues that you're going to be left with for trial of the case and that still is a very helpful use of the mediation process. So even if mediation isn't leading to settlement it has a positive effect in those it, cases. It can always have a positive effect mm -hmm. in those cases mm -hmm. if you can use it to resolve uh, uh, some of the issues in dispute. Mm -hmm. One of the things in the big in the big complex litigations is the case is actually bleeding money. Mm -hmm. So to get discovery shortened or to have um, three entities that are seeking the same discovery join in making one discovery demand, mm -hmm. mediation is a just an incredible tool to have those things happen, to help have those things happen. Mm -hmm. now, I'd like to second that idea and also put in a pitch for what seems to be the hopeless, unsettleable case the case where communications have broken down, where the parties are barraging the court with a flurry of discovery motions. They argue over even the most innocuous, innocuous document requests. That case sometimes is ripe for mediation to help change the mindset and reestablish communications. Mm -hmm. um, Judge Levy, I understand that in your district the mediators aren't paid, that they serve the court pro bono. Um, how do you convince them to take these cases and how do you convince them to take the complex case in particular? Well, I, I'm 
constantly surprised that people are willing to do this kind of mediation pro bono. And yours is not the only court, we might add, where this happens. So tell us why you think they are willing to do this. Well, I think, number one, there many lawyers are public service oriented. They feel it's a service to the court and to the justice system. Number two, they're willing to uh, get themselves out in the community to get some experience. Uh, and it looks good on their resumes. But we have many experienced mediators who are willing to be on the list. And uh, I, I, I think it, it must be part of the public service ethic. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask about, um, about when you're working with an attorney uh, or the attorneys and you're in chambers and you're talking with them about the possible use of mediation and you're getting some resistance from them because no, your courts do not mandatorily and automatically refer cases to mediation. So you're working with the parties. They have some say in this and you're getting resistance uh, from the attorneys. So you're pretty convinced that this case ought to be referred to mediation. Um, Judge Gilmer, what kind of objections do you hear from the attorneys and what do you do with that? Generally speaking, the kind of objection you hear comes at the Rule 16 scheduling conference when you're inquiring about the possibility of mediation and the parties feel that they haven't had sufficient discovery yet to be able to make a real assessment about whether the case could settle at mediation. I think that is a legitimate concern by the attorneys. Uh, they don't, if they don't feel that they have enough information to really evaluate the case, they're not going to be prepared for mediation. And if, if a lawyer objects at the beginning of the case from, from being uh, forced to go to mediation at that point in time, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would, I would uh, go along with whatever uh, their assessment was at the beginning of the case. Later in the case, the kinds of objections that you get usually uh, come from uh, the lawyer's experience with their own client and they're making an emotional assessment. They've, uh, they've assessed the factual and legal issues and then they're uh, assessing uh, the emotional willingness uh, of their client to participate in the mediation process and whether or not they think it would be completely futile mm -hmm. uh, to do so. Mm -hmm. And I would never actually force somebody to mediation that didn't think that the process would actually be beneficial and actually lead to a resolution of the case because if you don't have some sort of agreement going in, uh, I think that it's not a process that's going to be eventually very beneficial or helpful mm -hmm. to the party. So I would not make somebody go to mediation that absolutely objected. Mm -hmm. Judge Morris. I think Judge Gilmore touched on the thing that I try to lead the lawyers and talk to the lawyers about, and that is it's a process. So when they have resistance to it, we talk about it's a process and going through the process and that it is an exercise and, and that their clients and they might benefit from going through the process. And once I've described it, then they tend to go through the process. But we all also know that we're federal judges, and once a federal judge says to you, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't you think mediation would be a good way to go? By and large, you get sign-ons mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd, I'd try to do it a little more carefully than that so that it isn't just a, the judge has mandated we do it, so we're going to go sit down and just not talk, but we're going to go. Mm -hmm. I do talk about the process, and I also ask the questions of, um, without disclosing anything you're doing in negotiations, have you identified what separates you? Maybe a mediator can help identify what separates you. So I've heard Judge Gilmer say that she does not refer if the parties absolutely object to it, and I've heard you say that the power of your office can sometimes persuade parties they should participate in mediation. <laughs> Judge it's, it's somewhat the same, though. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the end, even if you find somebody who's a little bit resistant, you can still say, yeah. don't you think that this would be helpful to you? Yeah. And you do get some buy-in yeah. sometimes just by making that suggestion. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to ask Judge Levy if he has ever ordered parties to mediation over the objection uh, of the parties. No, I never have. But I've noticed sometimes that lawyers are afraid that if I send the case to mediation that I'll just back out of the case and disappear. Mm -hmm. And they need to have a firm hand. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want to be sure that there's always a judge there paying attention to their case. The other thing that, that seems to be important is, as, as I've heard um, Judge Morris say, is to educate the lawyers about the mediation process. They learn in law school about litigation, but they really don't know about mediation in the same way. At least it's, it's slow, the, the learning curve is slow. Mm -hmm. So it's important for the judge to encourage them and to tell them what the process is about and how it could help them. And do you find that once an attorney has been in a mediation process, they're more receptive to it? The Absolutely. The next time and the next time and... Yes. Yes. I if our mediator has been good, yes. Yes. Of course, mm -hmm. that's always mm -hmm. an important factor yeah. in it, yeah. Um, mediation, of course, is not the only form of ADR and it's not the f only form of settlement assistance available to attorneys and through the courts. 
Um, when you're making that initial assessment, Judge Gilmer, about the suitability of a case for mediation, are you considering other types of ADR as well, or even perhaps referring the case to uh, another judge for a settlement conference? We almost always use uh, the standard mediation process as the form of alternative dispute resolution uh, that we most suggest or refer uh, cases to. Uh, very often, however, cases uh, come in these days with uh, arbitration agreements or, or standard arbitration clauses in contracts, mm -hmm. and so uh, those cases aren't ones that we get too involved in making the determination about the, the right. method of alternative dispute resolution. Right. They right. just go uh, to arbitration as part of their agreement. But mediation is really the primary uh, tool that we use. We don't really use uh, court, um, uh, court run settlement conferences or conferences with the magistrates that much mm -hmm. in the Southern, Southern District of Texas because mm -hmm. the judges are, are busy and are in trial most of the time. Right. Uh, and the culture in our community uh, is for people to employ paid mediators and to uh, pay those mediators for their service of helping them with the resolution right. of the case. Right. Judge Levy, have you found that there are certain types of cases or circumstances where, in fact, having somebody who has the robe is more useful than referring the case to mediation? Yes. There are some cases where the lawyers simply say, look, Judge, we want you to tell us who's right and who's wrong, or tell us how this will play in front of the jury. You have the experience. You know what the damages are worth. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes uh, I tell them, look, this is a different kind of process from what you're thinking about. If you want an evaluation from me, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But you have a lot more freedom in mediation to mm -hmm. craft whatever you want. And I tell them that you can have any kind of mediation that you want. You can have a summary jury trial. You can have a high-low arbitration. We'll create this process any way you want it to be. You tell us how you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And they almost never take me up on it. Mm -hmm. They always want the traditional ways of doing things, either a judge's evaluation, a standard arbitration, or a mediation. I'd like to take a moment now to, to check uh, with my colleague Bob uh, Fagan because I understand that some faxes have come in with some questions for the panel. Thanks, Donna. In fact, yes, we received two faxes and we can take them each separately. Uh, here's one from Joe Barrett from the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Uh, is, there, are there, is there any reliable data to suggest that certain case types are better suited than others for mandatory mediation? Donna? The question is whether any types of cases are more suitable than others for mandatory referral to mediation. Judge Gilmer? I have not seen any data uh, along those lines suggesting that a particular type of case is more suitable for mandatory mm -hmm. uh, mediation, as we discussed earlier. We don't make man. We don't make decisions to, uh, generally speaking, uh, to have mandatory mediation for any cases. We don't have a local rule uh, to that effect. Uh, uh, maybe there is some some data that suggests that, uh, but that has not been my experience generally. Are there any types of cases or circumstances that would would um, compel you to order or to compel the parties to participate in in mediation? Um, as we talked about earlier, there are, particularly in the area of securities litigation, there are some cases, cases that are so complex that you really, really need the parties mm -hmm. to mediate, particularly because there are so many lawyers, mm -hmm. and it's just going to be more uh, uh, helpful for the parties, the litigants, everybody to mm -hmm. get together and have some serious face-to-face -face discussions. And there really isn't any other forum or opportunity uh, uh, to do that if they're not sitting at a table discussing the resolution the ultimate resolution of the case. Right, right. Uh, Bob, I understand that there's a second uh, fax. Would you read us that question? Sure, thanks, Donna. We received another fax from uh, Mary Jo Shoemaker, who's the ADR administrator from the Western District of Michigan. And here it is. If your court's philosophy is to accomplish ADR early, what types of situations might legitimately delay the process? The addition of parties, bankruptcy of a party, serious illness or death of a party, other? That's a, that question is a great segue, actually, for us into the next topic, which you're going to take up, which is the timing of the mediation session. But let's answer Mary Jo's question first. Uh, what would prompt you to delay uh, the mediation in a case? Judge Gilman. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you do it. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, go ahead, Judge Gilmore. Oh, things like the filing of motions for summary judgment, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if there is a motion for summary judgment pending, uh, sometimes the parties uh, want you to work on that motion and give you the answer to the issues that have been raised in that motion before they go to mediation so they can figure out who has the advantage on that particular issue. Uh, but I always make it a point in cases that we know that we are going to or have already referred to mediation to ask the parties do they want me to go ahead and work on the motion for summary judgment before they finish mm -hmm. the mediation and the outcome for me has been about 50 50 50 percent of the time they'll say no don't work on it now it'll be a waste of your time let us do this mediation first you may not ever mm -hmm. have to do it and the other half of the time they say it's really going to help us in terms of figuring out whether mm -hmm. or not we can resolve our case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I always ask. Mm -hmm. Has that been your experience as well, mm -hmm. Judge Morris? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's that summary judgment motion hanging out there that is usually the one that they want me to slow down and before they go to mediation for me to decide on that. And I, I, I do the same thing. We go through a, a litany of questions. Uh, there are, are there no factual disputes? Are you sure? Have you, have you discussed this? Do you... What, what have you done with your opposing party? Have you had any um, settlement negotiations? And so we go through the same sort of questions in that case conference before. Honestly, summary judgments are hard, long work. You want to make sure you do it and do it mm -hmm. carefully. So if they can resolve it, you also are saving yourself time. Right. It's a, right. Mediation is a tool, and that's one of the tools where right. it really helps the judge. But frankly, once the parties have spent the money on the summary judgment motion, it's very it, it, hard to pull it back. The parties want the return on their investment. So I find that the best way to deal with that is through the pre-motion conference to try to give the parties a sense of uh, where I'm leaning or if it's the district judge's case mm -hmm. where, where he or she is leaning. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that helps and it's enough to get the parties to negotiate because they fear an adverse decision. Mm -hmm. now's, the, now's the time to right. settle because yeah. this offer won't be on the table in right. two months. Right. Do you ever suggest to the parties that they not file that motion, that they wait and hold the mediation before they file their summary judgment motion? Yes, but I find that it's often important to have the clients there when we have that discussion because sometimes the lawyers and the clients haven't fully communicated about the issue mm -hmm. and the clients may be driving the lawyers in a way the lawyer uh, feels that the lawyer can't tactfully uh, resist. Mm -hmm. And that's a, another thing in terms of, of the court intervening or getting involved in the timing of the mediation process. For me, uh, if the lawyers have given me an indication that the case is not appropriate for mediation or ripe for mediation at the inception of the case, I will set a status conference, not all the way at the end of the discovery process when it's time for motions, but maybe part of the way through the discovery process by discussing with the lawyers how much time do you really think you need before you'll be able to at least make some evaluation of the case. And if we have a discovery process that's going to go on for maybe four or five months, we'll pick a point maybe midway through that discovery process as a time for them to come back to me mm -hmm. so that we can have another discussion about whether or not the case is appropriate or right for mediation then. Mm -hmm. It's before they've invested mm -hmm. as much time and money as they would have when they have already filed their motion for mm -hmm. summary judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Discussions about timing of the mediation usually involve consideration of two things, discovery and the summary judgment motion, mm -hmm. and when to hold that mediation session in relationship to either of those two things, mm -hmm. discovery or the summary judgment motion. Um, again, early on when the courts were first starting to use mediation, uh, there was, I think, a, um, a consensus that mediation would not be successful until discovery had been complete. Um, I think that thinking about that is changing, but I wondered if you would just uh, give me your views, Judge Levy, about the timing, the relationship between the mediation session and the completion of the discovery process. Well, I think it's a little like deciding which case is appropriate for mediation. It's ca a case-by-case -case analysis, mm -hmm. analysis. But in New York City, the city of New York always tells the court, let's try to see if we can settle this case now before we've run up the attorney's fees and the discovery costs, mm -hmm. particularly in cases where there's fee shifting, mm -hmm. where the, uh, the uh, prevailing party will recover fees. The defendants would much rather pay the money in settlement than in attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judge Morris, are your considerations different in bankruptcy? When do you want to see that mediation session held in the case? I think the considerations are the same. I, I think I might approach it just a little bit differently, and that is if I see the parties are going through discovery very smoothly, and that they are understanding through my case conferences, understanding what the issues are. Uh, some of the best mediators, negotiators, are lawyers, 
and um, I don't want to upset a balance that may be moving forward because by and large most everything we have settles before trial. So you want to make sure that it is moving and that they are moving toward discovery, that they are moving toward some kind of resolution or they are narrowing the issues. And if they're doing that without a mediator, I will not upset that balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I find there are certain times though that the mediator will, as you said, bring in the parties so the parties understand what's going on that I may not have in these case conferences. So, and that's, a, that's where you want a, a mediator. But I think a mediator can go in at any time that the case needs to progress to a resolution. Um, I think judging is an art. When to send it to mediation is an art. And th the timing is not scientific before discovery, before the summary judgment. It's the art of knowing the case and knowing the flavor of the case. Right. So two of the early efforts, and admittedly when mediation was very new to the courts, the effort to identify categories of cases and the effort to identify a time when it was right to send cases to mediation, experience has now shown us that it's, it's a bit futile to try to do that. That uh, like everything else in judging, there's, this involves judgment, right? That's why they call it judging. Right? That's why they call it judging. <laughs> <laughs> so what that, that, that requires then is that the judge be actively involved in the case because right. if it's an art, the judge needs to be feeling the pulse of the case right. constantly. Right. And whether it's through const uh, frequent case conferences or status reports or whatever, you the judge have to know if the obstacles to settlement have been reduced. And what, that, what it also uh, emphasizes is the importance of judges understanding the mediation process and other mm -hmm. ADR processes as well, but understanding that procedure well enough to know when it will be useful right. in the case. Right. Um, I wanted to ask actually a question about the communications between you and the mediator uh, during the mediation process. Somebody is going to be telling you uh, that there's a need to wait perhaps on, on deciding that summary judgment motion mm -hmm. or that it is time now to hold the mediation session or that more mediation sessions are needed. Who makes that communication to you, Judge Gilmer? It's, generally speaking, it is not appropriate for the mediator to have any contact with the court. The, the rare exception is uh, potentially uh, um, um, when a mediation has been in progress and the parties just need more time and it's, and it's going to interfere with the court's current scheduling order. Mm -hmm. I have on occasion had a mediator just write me a note to say, we are really making good process progress here. We're still in the process of, of conducting the mediation. We understand we're running up against a scheduling deadline. Uh, may the parties have a little bit of, of an extension there just mm -hmm. so that we can continue the process. Just a logistical question. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's only appropriate for a mediator to communicate to the court that the case is settled or not settled and that's it. No further details mm -hmm. uh, about the case. By and large, the, uh, the attorneys communicate with me not the mediator. Mm -hmm. And I continue the regular scheduled case conferences. Mm -hmm. um, we have everything is still teeing up for trial. The, the pre-trial um, motions and hearings are still going on and it would be the parties, not the parties, but the, litig the attorneys that are coming to me and saying we've been to mediation, we want to go again, can we postpone this? Mm -hmm. uh, can we come back in two months instead of a month mm -hmm. or six months because we are dealing with whatever? Mm -hmm. And they and basically then it becomes the question uh, that you ask um, without disclosing mm -hmm. your settlement negotiations. Have you pinpointed the issues? Are you moving forward on those issues? And you ask a few questions like that and if you think that the legitimate answer is that they are, then of course they can get the postponement. But it's the parties that are normally talking to me. And how are other kinds of problems communicated to, to you during the mediation process? To you, for example, Judge Levy, if, a, if the mediator is having a problem with the parties or the parties are having a problem with the mediator, how is that communicated to you? Well, I wear two hats. If I'm the referring judge, it's not communicated to me or it should not be communicated to me. We have an, uh, an ADR administrator who debriefs the parties and, and hears the problems. Mm -hmm. We're toying with the idea of getting an ADR judge to resolve these issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, in my other capacity as the uh, overseer, the judge who oversees mm -hmm. the mediation, I do hear these problems. Mm -hmm. I hear that a party has shown up for mediation when the, the mediator required the client to be there. I hear of ethical violations. Mm -hmm. 
and we try to keep a wall between the referring judge and the, uh, the mediation. Mm -hmm. I would love to spend a lot more time talking about the problems that arise, the ethical problems in particular, and how courts can handle those. But unfortunately, we've run out of time mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's really been a terrific conversation. Um, and I, I wish we could continue. But we need to go now to our next panel, a panel of mediators and attorneys. Um, we're going to bring those guests into the studio now, and while we do, here are some comments from other judges around the country. Thanks to all of you. If the parties have elected to use mediation, they know it's going to be done early, and therefore it's going to be done before summary judgments are even filed, let alone resolved. There are cases where, as the mediation process goes along, the parties working with the mediator conclude that there, that there has to be a judicial decision on one aspect or the other of the case. And in that instance, then the mediators have the authority to, to uh, slow down or, or adjourn the mediation until they get a decision from the judge on a particular issue. But that actually happens in the rare exception rather than the norm. There is a close relationship between summary judgment motions and uh, ADR. But that relationship goes both ways. In some cases, uh, it, it's very clear from the preference of the lawyers that they want a decision. Primarily, the defendant wants a decision on the summary judgment motion before proceeding to ADR. In other cases, uh, the lawyers are willing and sometimes very anxious to use the uncertainty of the outcome of that motion as an impetus for settlement discussions. There's some incentive for both sides to use that uncertainty um, to generate discussions about settlement. Our court uses magistrate judges for mediators because we've had a lot of training and experience. The bar expects it. Um, when we started our more formalized mediation program. There was no private pay mediation in our community. We're fairly small, and it was the court or nothing. Now there is a parallel private pay and actually government service mediation programs that are available at low or no cost. But even in light of that, the parties have a lot of comfort level in using the court services. I think that mediation can be your silver bullet in case management, but it's got to be a part of your overall case management. Uh, mediation works and is taken seriously by parties and counsel when it's part of an overall scheduling order uh, that the court set and that the court has the ability to adhere to itself and to require the parties to adhere to. Uh, if mediation is just set uh, in, uh, you know, off to itself uh, without being on a track uh, that is otherwise going to lead to disposition, then I think it's not uh, very effective. As part of the Rule 16 order, they have to check a box saying when they would like to talk about mediation or a settlement conference. And then toward the end of the case, in about the last four months of its life, we do another order telling them that they must have a personal conference and then file a status report letting us know whether they're going to take care of settlement discussions on their own or they want a court set a mediation or settlement conference. We found there are three principal advantages to using a panel of attorneys. First of all, mediation can take a lot of time, and it frees up an enormous amount of magistrate judge time if we use a panel of lawyers. Secondly, it's hard for any judicial officer to divorce themselves completely from that role as a judge when they're meeting in the capacity of a mediator. So that helps resolve that issue. And then finally, we found that even though we didn't have an established mediation system in either the federal or state court system in Michigan by recruiting and training a qualified group of mediators they've become the biggest proponents of the system then among all of their peers and that's helped us enormously in uh, establishing and promoting the system. Welcome back to this program on case management and mediation. We've brought three new panelists into the studio and asked them to reflect on the same questions we've just been discussing with the judges. I'd like to introduce them now. To my right is Magistrate Judge Susan Gavi, a magistrate judge in the District of Maryland. Judge Gavi has been on that bench since 1996 and in that position has conducted over 300 mediations for her court. She also serves as faculty for the Federal Judicial Center's Seminar on Mediation for Federal Judges. 
To my left is John Muth, partner with the firm Miller, Johnson, Snell, and Comiskey in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mr. Muth is a mediator on the panel of the Western District of Michigan and has mediated scores of cases for that district. He's also an active litigator and mediator in the private sector, specializing in complex commercial disputes. Altogether, Mr. Muth has me mediated over 200 cases. And next to Mr. Muth is Carol Elder Bruce, partner with the firm Ty, Patton, Armstrong, and Teasdale in Washington, D.C. Ms. Bruce has represented both plaintiffs and defendants in mediations before local and federal courts and has been a party plaintiff herself in a mediation with the D.C. government. Legal Times has named Ms. Bruce one of the top 20 litigation counsel in D.C. Congratulations. Thank you. And welcome to all of you. We're pleased to have you here. Um, all of the panelists, like you, have had the benefit of hearing the previous discussion among the judges and undoubtedly will have some comments on what they've heard. Um, we are going to be talking about some of the same issues that you've heard discussed already. Um, and I'd like to begin by asking you, as I did the judges, how you incorporate mediation into uh, your routine litigation practice. Carol, I'd like to start with you. Um, how do you use mediation in your practice? Well, I'll speak as a plaintiff's counsel now in saying that um, I regard mediation as just another opportunity to resolve a conflict that brought my client to me in the first place. Um, when a client uh, files a case in court, usually, if they're my client, always, they have tried to resolve the conflict before uh, filing the complaint in court. And uh, the mediation process in our federal district court here in Washington is such that at the first meet and confer that we have under Rule 16.3, our local rule, we have to discuss mediation, uh, the, the prospects of mediation, whether the clients fully understand the process, et cetera, et cetera. And I use that as an opportunity with my opposing counsel to try to get uh, discussions going, if they haven't already, mm -hmm. on settling the case. Mm -hmm. And I don't look at it as a sign of weakness mm -hmm. in doing that. Instead, I look at it as a sign of strength, almost mm -hmm. as when I was a federal prosecutor saying, this is your best opportunity to get out of this case at the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's sit down with a neutral mm -hmm. third party and try to settle this case. Mm -hmm. John and Carol, both of you litigate in districts where you know that your case might be referred to, to mediation. Uh, and you have the opportunity, Carol, you've described already, to sit with the judge in the Rule 16 conference and discuss what's going to happen with the case, as I believe you do as well, John. Um, what do you do in that conference when you're talking with the judge? Uh, how do you work with the judge to determine what's the appropriate uh, use of mediation in the case? Let's start with you, John. Well, I start thinking about mediation and I start talking to my client about mediation well before I show up at a Rule 16 conference. I know we like to think of ourselves as trial lawyers or litigators, and maybe it's a function of having gotten older, but I think of myself more as a problem solver or a dispute resolution lawyer as opposed to a trial lawyer. The fact of the matter is we spend inordinate amounts of time and obscene amounts of money, preparing for an event that only rarely takes place in our professional careers. That is a federal court jury trial. And so I look at mediation as being on the other end of the spectrum of a trial. The trial being the last resort and mediation being the first resort. Carol, what do you do when you're sitting there having that conversation with the judge and you think the judge is just mis mistaken in wanting or believing or suggesting that the case would be a good case for mediation? Well, in, in our district, we actually don't have a lengthy discussion at the Rule 16 conference about mediation. It is raised as one of the many issues that are raised or many, of the many uh, matters that are raised at the Rule 16 conference. But, uh, and by and large, in my experience, uh, the judges here in Washington don't press the issue. Um, they will bring it up, ask if the parties have met and conferred about the p potential for mediation, ask about the timing, if they would like to do it now or await uh, the end of discovery. Um, but uh, I've never had a situation where a judge has uh, interjected himself or herself into the case at that early stage 
to uh, insist that this is something that ought to be pursued. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I think in part, in large part, maybe entirely, that's because the judges respect the fact that this is an early uh, step in the case, uh, that it is a bit presumptuous, at least it would be perceived as presumptuous by a, a plaintiff who feels they uh, have a right of access to their courts mm -hmm. to be being pushed back out the door of the courtroom mm -hmm. by the judge. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the judges are very respectful of uh, the, the mm -hmm. person's right to file a complaint and to, uh, through counsel, uh, dis suggest and decide when it's best to go to mediation. Mm -hmm. Then who usually takes the initiative ultimately in making the referral to mediation? Do you request it or is it something the judge raises? In my experience, we usually get to a point in the case where that the, it's assumed that after discovery there will be a mediation period. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want it earlier, then you can request it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it's done usually so that by would the parties initiating. That would be at the part in the pro se cases, it's a little different. I've mm -hmm. seen, I've represented pro se plaintiffs um, where uh, judges have asked me to represent them uh, for mediation purposes only. Mm -hmm. I listened to the prior panel on, on pro se uh, and uh, I would say that in our district I think we have a very successful way of um, managing pro se uh, matters with mediation and you get the counsel appointed for mediation purposes only so the litigant has the benefit of the advice of counsel mm -hmm. and uh, in evaluating their case and in going um, into that mediation process. Mm -hmm. I might say that in our district, the judges are very proactive on dealing with the subject of mediation at the Rule 16 conference. It, it's something that is taken up uh, very early and strongly encouraged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the referral, however, is not made at that, at that point. May very well be. Mm -hmm. uh, in my mediation practice, I mediate disputes that haven't been filed as a case anywhere yet but are on the verge of being filed. I mediate uh, cases in the state court that don't even have things as mm -hmm. formal as a Rule 16 conference, mm -hmm. but where the parties decide to do it before they do any discovery. Mm -hmm. I mediate in federal court immediately after the Rule 16 conference and before mm -hmm. any discovery. So my view is that as long as the other factors are present that mm -hmm. suggest to you that the mediation is likely to be successful, the earlier the better. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, you've heard the judges say, or you've heard them describe the cases they consider to be suitable for mediation, and in fact almost every case is apparently suitable for mediation. Um, Carol, from an attorney's perspective, what case kind of case do you think makes a good candidate for mediation? I think it's less a function of the category of case than it is uh, uh, the, the nature of the attorneys mm -hmm. and the clients and what the goals are mm -hmm. of the plaintiff. Um, I can tell you what, what cases w would not be, uh, I won't say good candidates for mediation so much as ones where it would be uh, difficult to have a successful mm -hmm. and final mediation where there's actually a settlement. And from that would be cases in which a, uh, a defense attorney is uh, working uh, for uh, defense costs from an insurance company, perhaps in a med mal case, where they have an inattentive client, a trustful client that is not pressing the attorney to come to some resolution in the case, and where they are quite literally running the meter, mm -hmm. uh, the billable hour meter, have maybe legions of associates working on a case. Um, I found that those are very difficult cases to actually resolve early, that instead we may end up in mediation after discovery and after much money has mm -hmm. been spent and time has taken mm -hmm. uh, in the case. And for the, from the plaintiff's perspective, my, the clients who are not good candidates for a final resolution of the case through mediation would be uh, plaintiffs who are still angry, mm -hmm. um, that they haven't adopted the old saw of, you know, don't get, ang don't get mad, get even, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, bring your case and just mm -hmm. make this a, uh, a, a question of seeking justice. But they're mm -hmm. still, they still are emotionally invested in mm -hmm. what happened to them mm -hmm. as well. They, maybe they should be, but mm -hmm. the attorney's job is to channel that um, energy mm -hmm. um, so that it's no longer just anger and it's more a focus on how to resolve some, uh, the matter because it's going to come to a resolution someday. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the clients, again, who are least likely to be uh, the benefit from mediation, at least early on in the process, are those that are still angry, who have vilified the opponent and are not willing to listen to them yet, and who also happen to think their, their attorneys 
are the best doggone attorneys <laughs> in the world who mm -hmm. will win the day mm -hmm. in right. court. And so there's no need to settle or to discuss taking anything less than all that they're entitled to. Those are very difficult situations. And even though mediation may not uh, come to a final resolution, I think even in those cases, those are candidates for the process. Mm -hmm. So you go in and, and the client will then see that, oh, there is an opposing counsel who will be questioning me mm -hmm. at, um, at trial. These uh, matters that my, my counsel has told me are um, difficult questions of law and difficult factual situations. This attorney is going to figure what those are mm -hmm. and is going to cross-examine me. Mm -hmm. And it's not just an abstract problem. It's real. Right. So it's a good process. Right. Judge Garber, you are on the other side of this process. You are the recipient of the cases that have been referred. And in your court, many of the cases are referred to the magistrate judges and to you in particular mm -hmm. for yes. mediations. Um, from your perspective, what kinds of cases are most suitable and not suitable for mediation? Well, I am such a um, fan of mediation. I haven't met a case yet that I didn't think wasn't suitable for mediation. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't going to be successful, at least it moves the case, it changes the case. It narrows the case. Well, when uh, you were talking, Carol was talking about the, the case where an individual still very much is invested in it emotionally. To me, those are tremendously good cases, particularly for judge-hosted mediation, because they come in, people like that, whether it's a wrongful death action or a med mal, they come into the courthouse. They come into a, and I don't hold my cases, my mediations usually in the courtroom, but they come into a, a judge's chambers. There is the dignity and solemnity of the process. And they many times get their so-called they in court, what they really need, having someone, uh, a dispassionate individual, listen to their case and hear them out. For that reason, mediation is superb. I will have a public session, as all of us do, and then I'll have a private opportunity to speak to the individual. And that individual can tell me all the irrelevant things mm -hmm. to their case that are very important to them. Mm -hmm. So those cases, I think, are important, wrongful death or med mal. Those are important and good mediation cases. Um, I agree that there are some cases that maybe can't be settled in a, in a single mediation session. You may need to have a little bit of discovery. You may need the lawyer to do his or her thing. To, with the client sort of get excited about the case, discover the case, and then find out it's not everything we all hoped it to be. Mm -hmm. And it's at that moment, mm -hmm. sometimes it's best to come to mediation, about a third, maybe a halfway through mm -hmm. discovery. Mm -hmm. That timing mm -hmm. uh, is, is often the best, I mm -hmm. think, for cases that are not already known to each other. Mm -hmm. But some employment cases can come very quickly. For example, if there's been, if the employer has investigated in the EEOC process but not had a true mediation, they should know. So there are cases that ha enough facts have been mm -hmm. exchanged, they can come just right. like that, I right. think. Right. Mr. Muth, you too mediate cases, and you probably have received some that didn't seem quite ready or quite the right case for mediation. What do you do in that situation? Well, what I found is that my initial impression of readiness mm -hmm. is often wrong. Uh, the cases that I have sometimes felt should be the easiest to mediate have been the most difficult. Mm -hmm. On many occasions I've had lawyers and clients walk out at the end of the day saying to me, we never thought we'd get this <laughs> settled. We never thought we could possibly do it and yet it happened. Okay, I think so you have that? to get into the process really to know whether mm -hmm. it's a case that's appropriate at that moment. Mm -hmm. I think any case is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Now. We do a fair amount of sequential mediations. I mean, as a mediator, I don't give up just because at the end of the day we don't have a settlement. Mm -hmm. We turn the attention to process. Mm -hmm. What do they need? Mm -hmm. uh, every dispute, I think, has a nucleus to it. And one of the things the mediator is capable of doing through the course of a long day talking to people is to help identify that nucleus. It may be emotional. It may be informational. It may be legal. It may be that there's some other agenda that somebody's trying to push and using this case as a vehicle for that. But very quickly you find out what that is. And you try to f help the parties focus on what that nucleus is and help them devise ways to resolve it. It may be you need two depositions. It may mean that a motion has to be heard. 
Uh, it may mean that somebody needs a chance to vent and they need to let out the emotional component. We find a way to do that constructively in a mediation process. And so uh, I think any case is ripe. Mm -hmm. And you often don't know mm -hmm. until you're done. What is the added value here, Judge Garvey, for the judge? Um, you as a mediator, John as a mediator, are doing something for these cases that the judges aren't doing. The judges aren't doing it because... Uh, well, I actually do my mediation in my own cases when you? they're jury cases. And I, I and that's because I already know the case and, I, and I'm on top of it and I don't have to ask one of my colleagues to, to, to reinvent the uh, wheel, so to speak. The added value of a judge, I walk in with credibility. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I say, I only have credibility to lose with the parties. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm very favored. I'm very, I have an advantage over John mm -hmm. because I have, the, even though I don't wear the robe, they assume that I, and I do, I try cases, I, I have that experience. So I come with that aura of, uh, of impartiality, that aura of credibility, that aura of experience. So I do think, and I'm finding that judges, uh, district court judges who, could simply send out all their settlement work or their mediation work, now beginning to take an interest in doing it themselves because they see it as part of the, it's part of the judicial process. Settlement is not something that's over here. Mm -hmm. It's part, as we said, of the resolution of this problem. Mm -hmm. It's another technique of doing that. Right. But isn't it a very time-consuming process? Yes, it process. is. And as I think John does the same thing I do. I allow a whole day. I clear my, mostly, <laughs> I try to do that. And then I will frequently have a second a session, a follow-up phone calls. Indeed, it is very time consuming. And I certainly respect if the parties don't want me to mediate a case that I'm going to preside over because if some lawyers aren't comfortable. It is very time consuming. Most lawyers are delighted that I have that interest and I'm willing to make time on my calendar to help them resolve the case as efficiently and, and as inexpensively as possible. I want to ask about two particular case types as I did with the, the judge mm -hmm. panel. The first is the pro se cases. Have you mediated pro se yes. cases? Do you think you have a special advantage as a magistrate judge in mediating those cases or disadvantage? or? Um, I, I agree. I, I approach them with some discomfort because you're always trying to be neutral and when you have a disparity of, mm -hmm. of power or experience or knowledge, it's, it's always worrisome. Um, but I think they're perfect cases for mediation because, again, the pro se individual comes with respect for the court and you can, again, you create a level playing field as best you can and give invest that person with a dignity that they may not otherwise feel mm -hmm. in the process. So mm -hmm. I, I think they're well suited. I love the idea I heard Judge Levy say about appointing counsel to represent pro se in the mediation. That would even create a better uh, situation. But I find, uh, I find I've, I've settled one a week, week and a half ago, mm -hmm. um, and I do think they're well suited to mediation. Mm -hmm. And you, John, have you mediated cases I with pro not. se litigants? I have not mediated pro se cases, though you do from time to time uh, face some of the same problems as a mediator where there's a significant disparity mm -hmm. between the ability to counsel on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I as a mediator am always cognizant of is that I can't wear my lawyer's hat mm -hmm. and I can't litigate the case for the parties. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's my responsibility mm -hmm. to inform the defendant that he or she has missed two critical affirmative defenses mm -hmm. or that the plaintiff hasn't really pled the best theory to fit the facts of the case. I may have strong views on that, mm -hmm. but I certainly can't tip the balance. Yeah. And I want to come back a little bit later in this discussion to some of the kinds of problems that arise in the mediation and confront the mediator and the parties and the court with some difficult ethical and other kinds of, of issues. But before I do that, I want to ask about the complex cases. Uh, the judges obviously said, yes, complex cases are perfectly suitable for mediation. Carol, I wonder if you'd comment on that. Well, I would sort of circle back to what I said earlier. I think that, uh, yes, they can be and they should be very suitable for mediation. But I do think you'll find that oftentimes you will have, and I'm, I do defend cases of mediation too, so I'm, I'm not trying to always speak from the plaintiff's perspective, but it's um, something worth saying. And that is that uh, there will be some defense counsel usually, um, sometimes plaintiff's counsel, but uh, usually defense counsel, 
who are, are not paying attention to their case as it's unfolding. They're only sort of operating in a reactive posture of just responding to interrogatories, responding to document requests, and they're not thinking ahead in the case as to what this is costing their client to go to trial. They're just billing the hours and submitting their bills and getting paid. Um, and so in those cases where you have multiple defendants, um, you may find that there are some defense counsel and some clients who are interested in mediation early and often. The, the sort of the incremental, intermittent mediation that we've heard spoke of in the previous uh, panel and Judge Galvey has spoken of here. Uh, I think that, that's a very effective use of the mediation system, but there is going to be some resistance because some uh, attorneys, whether it's plaintiffs or defense, but in my experience, often defense, um, are going to make it uh, very difficult to really have a successful final mediation session. Mm -hmm. I've certainly seen this scenario that uh, Carol paints for us here, but I think one of the things the mediator has to be aware of are the legal economics mm -hmm. at work in any mediation. Mm -hmm. uh, she paints the picture well from the defense side. On the plaintiff side, uh, if that lawyer has a big mortgage payment due two weeks from now, uh, it may push in the other direction and you wonder if the result there is always fair. But one of the things I think is great about mediation is that while well, litigation is a lawyer-driven process, in its best form, mediation is a client-driven process. Particularly uh, in a complex case where there are business interests at stake very often. Uh, the driving force in the negotiations is often the CEO and not the lawyer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're very interested in what all this mm -hmm. is going to cost mm -hmm. them, That's how why. long it's going right. to take. Mm -hmm. I understand that we have a question that has uh, been faxed in earlier, so I'd like to take that question before we continue. Thanks, Donna. We received a fax from Michelle Roybal uh, from the U.S. District Court in the District of uh, Utah, the ADR Administrator. What is the perception of co-mediation? Do the panelists think it is a benefit to have two mediators participate in one session? For example, one could be a substantive expert in the area of law, and one could be a procedural expert in providing a mediation forum. Additionally, might having two mediators be a benefit in a scenario with multiple parties? It fits very well with what we've just been discussing, the complex case, multiple parties, and when do you call in another mediator to work with you, John? I have had experience with it very successfully in a number of cases, and I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, we were mediating a case not long ago that dealt with retiree health benefits that were in danger of breaking a company. And I'm no expert on ERISA law. Uh, I'm no expert on management of a company in financial distress. So we brought in as a co-mediator a university management professor who worked with the company to show them how they could so organize their company, so uh, readjust their finances so that they could maximize the return for the retirees. It worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mediated a dispute between two cities who had been at war with each other for 30 years over sewer and water expansion issues. We had three mediators. Uh, I was running the process. We had a water sewer engineer talking to the technical folks, and we had a forensic accountant talking to the people who were uh, keeping track of the dollars. And it worked beautifully in, all, in those cases. I think you have to identify a need that is technical in nature or specialized in nature. Bring somebody in. Let the lawyer mediator worry about the process uh, because you don't want two mediators fighting over what direction you're going to take things but use the second or the second and third mediators as a resource. Mm -hmm. I had a situation somewhat different than that. I, I wouldn't call it a co-mediator but I had a, a physics professor because it was an IP case, an intellectual property case, that had been ten years in our courts up and down and up and down. Very complex scientific and I never took any science in high school. Okay, <laughs> And so uh, I had this physics professor and it, it kept everybody honest because he sat next to me. He, he didn't have a speaking role largely uh, but uh, he kept everyone honest so that the issues got put on the table 
and I wasn't bamboozled as, as much as I might have been as to the strength and weaknesses. So I thought it was a very effective way of dealing. When I saw when there was a need, it was like a courts expert mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, in the mediation mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. In in the small amount of time that we mm -hmm. have left, there's two other things that I'd like to make sure we talk about. One is about the timing of the mediation. We heard the judges talk about it. I want to make sure we get it from the perspective of the mediators and, and the attorney. Uh, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the problems that arise and the ethical issues uh, in uh, mediation in court cases. Um, but first about the timing. Of course, as you heard, the conventional wisdom was the mediation can't really be successful until after discovery is complete. Carol, what's your view on that? I don't think I think that's so in most cases, in most traditional tort cases or, or contract cases uh, that do not involve m multiple parties. Um, I think uh, that, that what is true, though, is that there probably has to be some exchange, uh, informal exchange of information between the parties, either at the mediation session or in between sessions. Um, I think um, that, uh, that is what, what's really key with respect to the timing of mediation and trying to have it occur earlier is that the judges be involved in this process to encourage it, if not at that initial conference as we spoke of earlier, at a status an early status conference mm -hmm. uh, and to be available to the parties um, to encourage it even further. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it seems to me that if um, you, uh, if you assume for the sake of argument that a motion will be granted um, in the course of the mediation, and the mediator is more of a, an evaluative mediator instead of just a facilitator, somebody who is willing mm -hmm. to, to give some evaluation of the case, um, then with that informal discovery, with certain assumptions as part of the mediation process, uh, the parties can, uh, and it's certainly in their interests, uh, to resolve the, to resolve the case mm -hmm. early. You said it's particularly helpful when the judge is involved. What kind mm -hmm. of involvement are you looking for from the judge? Well, I mean, a, a judge could offer to um, hold a settlement conference or refer it to a magistrate judge for a settlement conference. It may be, and I, I've been in cases in which I, I think that's the best way to go, at least as the first step, if nothing else. Why? Because uh, I think judges in, uh, are more um, are more inclined to be straight talking. With, uh, with clients, with parties, mm -hmm. about the uh, cost of mm -hmm. the uh, litigation and, and not the cost of the judicial system mm -hmm. because, again, I, I think people should have a mm -hmm. access to their courts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, not so much a cram-down situation where they're going to cram mediation down their throats, but the, the authority, the prestige of the court, in, in, in suggesting um, that mediation is a good way to resolve a conflict that will be resolved someday and that it's a way to resolve it in a fashion where you have some control of the process mm -hmm. and where you lose control completely when the jury goes out to deliberate mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. is, uh, is helpful. Right. Judge Garvey, you have seen it all in mediating <laughs> over 300 <laughs> yes, cases. <I> have, right. <laughs> What's your view about the timing? Is there an optimum time for I, mediation? I Ray, every time I'm speaking to the lawyers, whether it's in one of my own cases or it's a case I may have referral for discovery disputes or for media, I raise settlement mm -hmm. every time I do that. If I've just resolved a complex discovery dispute, I might say, well, this is a good opportunity now that we're talking. Let's see, do you want to set in a settlement conference? Every, if I have my own case and I'm ready to go to trial and pretrial conference, I raise the issue. So to me, and I think we were talking, Carol, off camera about it, is that when you're doing a litigation plan as a lawyer, you don't have in there, think about settlement. On, on day 62, think about it. So that's the job, I think, of the court to remind the parties we should always be thinking about how can we resolve this problem? Is this, let's keep this idea on the front burner. So I think that cases can be mediated very early on. And if that's not a good time, I'm like, John, how about let's come back in a month after mm -hmm. you've done this or after you've had an auditor come. Mm -hmm. Just constantly keeping the conversation going and keeping, say, what else do you need? What do you need before it's going to be more productive? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that so I to me timing is early and often mm -hmm. is is the way I do it. Any opportunity I think we need to raise it. Mm -hmm. John, where do you want that case to be sitting relative to the summary judgment motion? When you get it? Well, the summary judgment motion can be an impediment to the resolution of the case where people are fixed in their legal positions. Uh, and if you find that you can't get the case resolved before then, uh, that's not a reason why you can't come back and resolve it right afterwards. So early and often, I think, is, is a good set of a few words to describe how you ought to approach it. 
Now, when I mediate a case, I always ask if there are significant legal issues. I want to know that in advance. I want to know what the fact issues are. But if there are legal issues, I want to know what the positions are, what the seminal authority is. And I'll prepare for the mediation mm -hmm. as if I were to hear the summary judgment motion. And very often, I can work through the legal issues with the parties in the context of litigation in a way that results in them being able to get the legal dispute at least behind them in terms of risk analysis. Because there's a wi risk of winning, there's a chance of losing almost any motion that's put to any court. And if you can get the parties to factor that risk in with the other risks, then I think we can save the court a fair amount of work down the road. Right. I want to move on with a few minutes we have left to talk about the problems that arise, but I can't do that until I give the attorney in our group a chance to speak to the timing issue. We've heard from both the people who mediate. Carol, tell us from the attorney's perspective what you think the timing should be uh, relative to uh, summary judgment. To summary judgment. Yeah, and, and discovery. Well, if um, it, it really is, um, it's a risk analysis. Mm -hmm. um, am I going to win this motion? Am I not? And, it, and it's not always uh, something as, as big as a summary judgment motion. I had a case in which um, there was a motion pending about the testimony of a witness. Would it be allowed or would it not be allowed? And I frankly wanted to, uh, to resolve the case through settlement discussions, mediation, whatever, before that motion was decided um, because I, I wasn't 100% confident I was going to win that motion. I knew that if I won that motion, I'd win the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, were, so the parties then, I think in every case, it's very case specific. Mm -hmm. You really have to uh, think about how big the issues are mm -hmm. and what is the likelihood, if you mm -hmm. can, you know, guess that, mm -hmm. of uh, whether you're going to prevail or not on a motion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I uh, will have to agree um, with uh, both Judge Garvey um, and John that early and often is the rule that I use and I, I don't think I have any apologies to anyone to uh, to use that rule. It's mm -hmm. not as if I think it's a sign of weakness mm -hmm. that I'll broach the subject of uh, mediation. Right. Instead I look at it as a sign of strength. Again, right. I'll offer, a, make a good offer right. um, of settlement right. uh, coming out early right. on and that just offer will just keep going up right. unless I lose a motion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use our last two minutes okay. to talk about the kinds of problems that arise in, in mediation. Um, John, when you're mediating a case uh, and you run into a difficulty with the parties, what, can you tell us what that would be? What kind of problems might you run into? And who do you go to with that problem? Well, uh, if I can take them in reverse. I, I think it's the mediator's obligation to solve the problem. That because of the confidentiality requirements that uh, uh, govern the process, uh, I can't run to the court. I can't run to the magistrate. Mm -hmm. Unless there's really a serious matter of mm -hmm. ethical violation where my obligations as an officer of the court uh, run into my obligations of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And I think when that happens, and it's happened very, very rarely, my obligations as an officer of the court trump the confidentiality. I think the mediator has to handle it. But I try to avoid those issues coming up by having a pre-mediation telephone conference where we deal with the kinds of things that can be problematic, lack of authority. Who are you going to bring? And I don't care who that person is, but what I do care is that the opposing party thinks that's the right person, mm -hmm. and they're satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, I want some indication of where people are with their bargaining so that we don't get into a half a day argument about whether somebody's in good faith or they aren't being in good faith because they've got a $5 million price tag on a $200,000 case. Mm -hmm. And so you get into those things, you try to work through them, sometimes you can't. And we could talk for a long time about these things, and I really wish we could, but we've run out of time. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. It's been a terrific discussion. Um, please stay with us while we again make a quick change here in the studio. We'll return in a few minutes for a final fast-paced discussion of what judges would like attorneys to understand about mediation and what attorneys and mediators would like judges to understand. 
Until then, here are a few more comments from our other judges. I'm a trial judge. I like to try cases. And in the bankruptcy court, there is this uh, sense, perhaps a myth, that uh, this already is a collective process aimed at settling disputes. And so what you have, a group of lawyers uh, who have that focus and have those skills, and that perhaps you don't need an extraneous process uh, to uh, help that happen. Uh, I must say I've come 180 degrees in the other direction in the past uh, six or seven years as we begin to extensively use ADR and particularly mediation uh, in our cases, and largely because I've had some huge multi-party intractable disputes uh, that uh, managed to resolve themselves with the, the assistance of a mediator uh, when uh, both the lawyers in the case and I myself were very skeptical that that could ever happen. Additionally, the ADR skill set of mediation and problem solving and issue identification is something we use in discovery matters and in um, summary judgment. Frequently I'll do a summary judgment hearing and finesse or resolve several of the issues by getting the parties to agree as to a result and then leaving the true legal issue left to be resolved. So that helps the courts. And then as far as case management, the parties know what to expect and when in terms of what, what the court will be expecting them to do, which will be at least to talk about a settlement conference and hold one with the court before they get to trial. Our philosophy is that the best way to get a case settled is to get the parties talking about settlement before their, par their positions have hardened and before they've expended all of the discretionary dollars on preparing for the trial and discovery. So we've found that once we convinced the lawyers that this actually worked, that cases settle much more easily if it's at the beginning than if it's at the end of the trial preparation process. I asked the lawyers to prepare uh, a plan uh, for the case for discovery and the like, which includes a statement uh, regarding their preference for ADR, not only the nature of the ADR process that they prefer, but also the timing that they think would be appropriate. And I will explore that further in terms of uh, what type of discovery, if any, do they think they need to, to complete before discussing settlement. Uh, when they think uh, the best time would be, um, and other issues of that nature. I think here, uh, for federal judges, particularly those who don't have a, an extensive mediation program, the state court context in which you work is critically important. Uh, and in my particular state, North Carolina was one of the leaders in the court indexed ADR. And we've had a state court mandatory uh, program for years and years and years now, so it's no surprise when I raise with lawyers the possibility of mediation. We use the panel certified by our state Supreme Court. When a case uh, has completed mediation, whether it's settled or not, it's important for us to preserve the confidentiality of the process. And therefore, the only thing we get back from the mediators is either a notice that the case is settled or a, case that, or a notice that the case has not settled. Welcome back to this final short panel uh, on mediation and its relationship to case management. I have only two questions I'm going to put to the panelists, and I'd like all of you to answer these, these two questions. Um, and we have only about eight or nine minutes to do this in. So um, first of all, I'd like to ask each of you for a piece of advice. And I'll start with you, Judge Gilmer. What would you like attorneys uh, members of the bar in general, not the attorneys in a specific case in front of you, but what would you like attorneys in general to understand about mediation and about how the court uses mediation? Well, I would like attorneys to think about mediation uh, as a possible uh, means of helping their client to efficiently resolve their case at the very beginning of the case and throughout the case. Uh, until such time as the case is uh, resolved short of trial. And to think about the fact that the, the, the courts are busy, the judges are busy, but that we are willing to help the lawyers get to uh, the mediation process. Uh, but sometimes we need some reminding and prodding uh, as well, and that we can be good partners in terms of helping to resolve a case uh, if we work together and to keep the lines of communication open with the court. Mm -hmm. And Judge Levy, same question for you. What do you want the attorneys to understand? I would like the attorneys to understand that mediation is an integral part of litigation. That 
I wanted to get some perspective from the beginning of the case that we see the end of the road at the same time as we travel along the beginning parts of the road. I want the attorneys to understand that we, the court, are referring cases to mediation not to get rid of them, um, and not because it helps our docket, but because we think it's better for them in the long run. That this case that they've given us will be decided one day or another, whether it's by a jury, by a judge, or by themselves, and that there is going to be a decision, and they could have that decision today rather than two years from now at much less expense and with much more participation on their part. That litigation is the least uh, efficient and most costly way of resolving a dispute, that they're here before us because they can't resolve their disputes on their own, but they can try at this point, that they have a common interest in trying to resolve this dispute. So I want them to change their mindset, think less like attorneys, but more like advocates for their clients at that point, uh, and trust in the process. Mm -hmm. Carol, what would you like the judges to understand as an attorney? Well, I think what I would like the judges to understand as an attorney is that um, we will always think as uh, advocates, as Judge Levy just said, but that uh, we, in going to mediation, will act um, as advocates for our clients at every opportunity, and, and, and yet we need the judges to uh, let our clients know in every opportunity they have in court proceedings about the benefits of mediation and about uh, the benefits of listening to the other side so that if our clients and the clients of, the, uh, of our adversaries are hearing this from the court, then it has the imprimatur of the court, mm -hmm. um, and the, the whole process of mediation. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't go to mediation and take off my adversary's hat altogether. Um, because I want the other side to know that if we can't come to some reasonable solution of the case, this is what they're going to see in court. I will be asking hard questions, and I will be uh, making demands on the other side. Mm -hmm. And finally, you, John, what would you like the judges to understand about your work as a mediator in court-referred cases? Well, I'd like the judges to understand how valuable a service mediation is that is offered to our citizenry. Uh, I think it's almost a misnomer in some respects to talk about mediation in the context of case management. Uh, I think it's better to think of it in the context of overall dispute resolution. I know as lawyers and maybe as judges we get caught up in dockets, deadlines, deposition schedules, motions, pretrial orders, trials, and we are so focused upon the mechanics that we lose sight of what we're really trying to do. And what we're really trying to do in a very simplistic way is to help people solve disputes. And so I like to think of it as a cooperative effort between the court and, in my case, the private mediator, or perhaps, in Judge Levy's case, the magistrate mediator, uh, of working toward an appropriate solution to problems that somebody brings mm -hmm. to the system. And I think you've already started at least to answer my next question, which I want to put to each of you, and that is, what advice or rule of thumb would you have for the judges in our audience today about the relationship between case management and mediation? I think that mediation is an integral part. It's not an adjunct of what the courts do. Uh, and it deserves perhaps more attention than some courts have given in the past. We've been fortunate in the Western District of Michigan to have had a bench that has been very, very supportive of this and very encouraging of it. And something happens over a period of years as a result of that interplay between the bench and the private bar. And that is you develop a culture in the legal community that supports fosters and nurtures mediation as the preferred way to solve disputes. Mm -hmm. Carol, one last word. Um, I would think that one thing that seems to work very well in John's district and others is that the mediators, especially in the complex cases, are paid mediators. While I, I think it's extraordinarily admirable in your district, Judge Levy, and in Washington, D.C., that there are so many volunteer mediators, in these large complex cases, um, it seems to me that when the parties are actually paying for mediation, um, then maybe they'll, they'll 
have more of a commitment to the process and not just go through the motions. That's one thing I'd say with respect to case management. The second thing I'd say is that uh, judges, um, to encourage mediation, should also, I think, fully appreciate if they haven't themselves ever participated in mediation as a representative of a client in their prior life, mm -hmm. that they should fully appreciate just how um, excellent an opportunity it is for clients, uh, especially plaintiffs, to uh, vent their feelings and for defendants to express any remorse without admitting responsibility, mm -hmm. perhaps, and to yet also have confidential, totally confidential communications with a third party who could assist all the parties in coming to a resolution, mm -hmm. something that can't really happen in a judge-driven uh, settlement conference when that judge is going to be hearing the case, because you're not going to show your cards completely about the weaknesses in your case mm -hmm. to a judge who's going to hear your case. Right. Judge Levy, one last comment on that relationship. I think a judge has a tremendous responsibility to prepare the parties, the clients, as well as the lawyers for mediation, to make it clear that the court expects the parties to negotiate in good faith, that it understands it's in their best interest, that it will support the parties in any way possible and necessary, that it will always be available, that it will hold uh, the parties to deadlines and resolve disputes and remove obstacles, but in the end, that it's their responsibility and the court expects them to take that responsibility seriously. The last word is yours, Judge Gilmer, in a few uh, seconds, if you could give us your view on it's that. It's been very helpful to me to be here, and it reminds me of how important it is for us to continue to think about mediation and for my colleagues to think about mediation as a tool to help resolve the disputes and to spend as much time thinking about mediation uh, as we do spending time scheduling uh, working on summary judgment motions and other uh, means that we have at our disposal to resolve a case ultimately. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks to these panelists and to Judge Morris and Judge Gavi as well. I know you appreciate as much as we do our panelists' willingness to discuss their experiences. I want to thank all of them and I want to thank all of you for being with us today. And now I'd like to return this to Bob. Thanks, Donna. I'd like to tell you about a new program the Center is launching this month, the Program for Consultations and Dispute Resolution, which will provide on-site consultations to district and bankruptcy courts. If your court wants to establish an ADR program or enhance an existing program and would find it useful to consult with an ADR expert, please call Donna Steenstra or Laurel Hooper. They'll arrange for one of the project consultants to come to your court at no cost to you to discuss your questions. The consultants are judges and court ADR staff who have substantial experience in ADR. They can provide consultation on most topics in ADR. An email has been sent to all federal judges, clerks of court, ADR administrators, and others announcing this new program. I'd like to remind you that many written materials on ADR can be found at the Center's website. You should see the website address on your screen. Let me remind you also to please complete an evaluation, which was part of the downloadable materials on the DCN. As always, we very much appreciate your feedback. Thank you for joining us today. Keep an eye on the FJTN Bulletin for other upcoming programs of interest, and we'll see you on our next FJTN broadcast. <laughs>